Joining us now is lead mirror scientist, Stephen Bongiorno. Stephen, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. One of the big questions I have right off the bat is about the work you do with the mirrors, because I know they're essential for the mission, but they're very complex and sent. Nap.
NASA is taking an extreme look into the mysterious regions of outer space. Extreme! Ixby, the imaging X-ray polarimetry explorer, is investigating neutron stars, black holes, dark energy, dark matter. All words you might hear during a rigorous speed dating round sponsored by Mensa. With its finely tuned instruments peering into our solar system and beyond, phrases like polar jets of actic galactic nuclei will soon be more popular than the next Buckaroo Banzai franchise. Check out XP and put the Geek Squad on notice. Welcome to NASA EDGE. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. We're in Hangar AE on the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. And today we're talking about the ICSPE mission. And what does ICSPE stand for? ICSPE's great, but also Launch Services Program is launching a rocket from Pad 39A, a really cool event for ICSPE. Are you trying to dodge the question? So what's the, what's ICSPE stand for? Uh, you're you're going to go there, right? Okay, That's so right. it's the Imaging X-Ray Polymetry Explorer. Great job. Yeah. Hey, I tell you what, this is an exciting mission. Anytime we're dealing with space and astrophysics, it's really cool because you know, researchers and scientists are going to be looking at black holes, supernova, supernova remnants, uh, quasars, pulsars, uh, even the galactic center. And I love all those cool things, but I got to tell you, Chris, I have a little bit of intellectual and academic anxiety because I feel like that kid that has the dream that, that there's a pop quiz or a test all of a sudden and he's <laughs> not prepared. I, I, I hope that I'm up to the challenge today for this show. Well, I tell you what, when you interview Brian Ramsey, who is the deputy principal investigator, start off with the word polarization and see where they get you. Okay, all yeah. right, well, Sad, thanks for the tip. That's a good way to start the show. I tell you what, we're just over uh, 13 hours away from launch, and let's take a look at the pad where we see the Falcon 9, and inside is the XB uh, spacecraft. But coming up, we're gonna be talking to Paul Hertz, who is the astrophysics uh, division director at NASA headquarters. And welcome back to NASA Edge. Joining us now is Paul Hertz, who's the Division Director for Astrophysics at NASA Headquarters. How are you doing, Paul? Uh, today's a great day. I'm really looking forward to this launch tonight. Yeah, just over 13 hours away. Are you stressed out yet? Are you excited? I'm excited, and I don't have to be stressed because I'm not on the XP team. <laughs> I'm here for the show. That's good. So, as being the Division Director, uh, what are the goals, uh, NASA goals of astrophysics? Well, we want to understand the universe. We want to understand how did the universe come to be and how has it evolved. We want to understand how the familiar night sky of galaxies, stars, and planets came to be. And we want to understand, are we alone in the universe? And, and what are some of the programs do you have within astro, astrophysics? So we sponsor a, a full range of research for the U.S. science community to investigate the universe. And that's everywhere from uh, grants to researchers at universities and research labs to do their own work with their graduate students and their postdocs uh, to uh, small missions, uh, the ones that we launch on sounding rockets, balloons, uh, medium-sized space missions like XB and the great big space missions like the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope. Space Telescope. So it's a, a full program to uh, investigate the universe. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that because you know, NASA Edge has covered some really cool astrophysics missions in the past like TESS and RADx. Uh, and so you, ha no, I, I was just going to ask you, you, you have the, the whole gamut when it comes to your assets. You have space base, you have air base with Sophia, and then you have, of course, ground base as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great job to be in charge of all of that. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the important thing to recognize is that you can't start 
with a Hubble Space Telescope or a James Webb Space Telescope. You, you've got to have the research that leads to the missions, that develops the technology. I mean, ICSPI is flying uh, uh, X-ray mirrors that were developed at Marshall Space Flight Center over a period of years, tested on sounding rockets uh, before they were ready to put onto a satellite like ICSPI. Um, we have to develop the techniques for analyzing that kind of data, and that's done by scientists all over the country. Um, and then we, we want to have missions uh, to investigate all parts of the universe, and that takes uh, different kinds of observatories, right? You need the visible light observatories like the Hubble Space Telescope. You need the infrared observatories like the James Webb Space Telescope. You need X-ray observatories like the Chandra X-ray Observatory, right. which is our great observatory for X-rays. But if you want to measure polarization, you need a mission like XB. You know, you, you, you actually uh, lead me to my next question. You know, we've done many missions in the past dealing with X-ray, X-rays. How is XB different than other X-ray missions in the past? Well, that's the four-syllable word, <laughs> polarization, <laughs> right? So whereas a mission like Chandra uh, takes exquisite images, right, and also can measure the energies of the X-rays, which, which we translate into colors in the Chandra images, uh, what it doesn't measure is the polarization of the light. And, you know, when light scatters off of surfaces, it can be polarized, where it's all vibrating in the same direction right. uh, and not, scat not random directions. Uh, you get an example of that when sunlight scatters off of a body of water, the light gets polarized, and that's why your polarized sunglasses are so effective. Uh, what ICSPI can do is measure the polarization of the X-rays, and that tells us about the surfaces they scattered off of, the magnetic fields and the structure down there close to the black hole, close to the neutron star, where we can't see because it's hidden by the gas and dust and plasma that surrounds those dense objects. Now, what's next after XB? Now, we have the uh, Astronomy and Astrophysics Decadal Survey that came out recently. Uh, what, are sort of, what are some of the goals that NASA is going to be looking at over the next 10, 15 years? So when you say what's next, I don't actually go 10 or 15 uh, years. I go two weeks. In two weeks, we're launching the James that, Webb Space that's Telescope, true. which will be the largest space telescope ever launched. Uh, it's taken us a very long time to build because it's, it's got so much advanced technology in it, and it's, it's very difficult to build. It's 18 one-and-a-half-meter mirrors that will be working together to create a six-and-a-half-meter telescope. We're going to put it uh, a million miles away from the Earth. We're going to unfold a tennis court-sized sun shield to block the sun, keep it cold. It'll operate at 40 degrees above absolute zero, and it's so sensitive and so powerful, we'll be looking at the first stars and the first galaxies cool. that formed after the Big Bang. So that's what's next. next right. Okay, now if we're talking about the long term, we did just receive from the National Academy of Sciences a decadal survey. So once every 10 years, we ask the National Academy of Sciences to to figure out, to tell us what are the most important areas of science, and then to recommend a program of both research and missions right. to ad address that important science. Uh, the science they laid out for the next 10 years is awesome. Uh, they, sa they said there are three areas of science which we should concentrate on. One is on planets around other stars, exoplanets. Right. Uh, and whereas the last 10 years we've sent we spent discovering them and realizing that they're very common, that almost every star in the sky has a family of planets around it, and that many of them are rocky and are in the habitable zone of their star. They said for the next 10 years, we should concentrate on developing the, the ability to measure the light, reflected light, coming from those rocky habitable zone exoplanets around nearby stars and seeing if they have um, life indicating um, um, gases in their atmospheres, methane, ozone, carbon dioxide, okay. water. Um, so that's, that's one area of science. The second area of science is to uh, realize that we, in the last 10 years, we figured out how to measure signals from the universe that okay. aren't light, in particular gravitational waves. Uh, we now have the, the uh, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, working, and it is seeing ripples in space-time caused by merging black holes and merging neutron stars. Right. And what we want to do is we want to have the capabilities to be able to quickly look at those sources um, with a telescope from space and see the light that's coming from those same things. Understand these, most energ these energetic events that can actually bend space-time right. and make ripples. And the third is to understand where did we come from, 
right? How do we connect the dots from the Big Bang to the first galaxies to our own galaxy to stars right. to the materials we're made of, this whole cosmic ecosystem? So that's a pretty big slate of science to do over 10 years. It sure is, Paul, and we're, and we're looking forward to seeing what's going to happen, you know, and, and what kind of spacecraft we're going we're to see and what kind of data we're going to get back. But, Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Good luck tonight. I hope you get some rest. Oh, I'm, it, I'm, 1 o'clock in the morning is going to be coming soon. I, I'm, I'm, I'm bulldozing through. I'm, I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to be there bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for that launch at 1 o'clock in the morning. All right, Paul. Hey, when we come back, uh, Blair is going to be talking more about the XPS science. Joining us now is Brian Ramsey, who's the Deputy Principal Investigator for XP. And I don't know if you heard earlier, uh, Chris suggested that I ask you first about this unique word, polarization. Can you tell us about that and how it relates to XP? Sure, sure I can. So um, X-rays are electromagnetic waves. Uh, they, uh, like all electromagnetic waves, they have an electric vector. Uh, if we collect a whole lot of x-rays from a source and all those vectors are in exactly the same direction, all those fields are pointing in the same direction, we say that uh, that radiation is 100% polarized. And if those uh, directions of the electric field are all at random, we say it's totally unpolarized and there's everything in between. And why that's important uh, is because um, we're looking at very dramatic objects. Uh, we're looking at... Uh, very, very high temperatures, uh, matter swirling down onto black holes, or incredibly intense magnetic fields, uh, a thousand million million times the field of the Earth. And uh, in processes like that, the X-rays that are generated are polarized. And mm -hmm. so by measuring polarization, uh, we measure the degree uh, and the angle of the polarization, we can sort of probe the mechanisms inside these really exotic sources. And, and that's fascinating. And the next question I have is when I hear that is, well, how does it work in terms of ICSPI? Right. So we have some very special detectors on board that were uh, contributed by our Italian partners. Mm. Uh, these uh, detectors are what really have made ICSPI possible. Um, they uh, have a special gas inside uh, that absorbs the X-ray. So the X-ray, actually we have mirrors above the detectors. The X-rays are focused onto the detectors. Uh, and when they interact with the gas, uh, they're converted into an electron. Uh, and this uh, electron is shot out of the atom and then it comes to rest in the gas. And that uh, initial direction of emission of the, of the electron is in the same direction as the electric field. So if we collect lots of these events in our detector and we measure the direction that the photoelectron is emitted, then we have a measure of the polarization of the X-rays. It's, it's fascinating to me. I mean, I understood some of that. Uh, I'm really trying because I'm kind of feeble in that area, but I got to tell you, still exciting. And I'm wondering, from NASA's standpoint, have we done any other X-ray missions that use this polarization technique? Uh, no, this is the first mission that's sort of dedicated to, to polarimetry. As you heard from Paul, we have other X-ray astronomy missions that are flying now, and they do imaging and spectroscopy and timing and things like that. But this is the first mission that will have uh, polarization capability. Um, the interesting thing here is that uh, the uh, principal investigator for XP, so I'm the deputy, the principal mm -hmm. investigator is Martin Weiskopf. And uh, he actually made the first measurement uh, of X-ray polarization from a cosmic source, the Crab Nebula, uh, in the early 70s. Wow. And that was followed up by a satellite measurement. Uh, it was a very small polarimeter, one of a suite of instruments uh, on a satellite, and that confirmed that measurement. And the very interesting thing is that from that day to now, there have been very few additional measurements. And so here we are. Um, 50 years later, and uh, we're about to launch what's needed, and that's a mission 
dedicated to uh, X-ray to polarization. That's fascinating because then we have that data to compare all the ICSPI data with. Uh, looks like a lot of cool scientific things coming from ICSPI. Brian, thanks so much for being on the show. Sure, welcome. Last week, I had a chance to learn more about the mirrors on XP. Let's check it out. Joining us now is lead mirror scientist, Stephen Bongiorno. Stephen, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. One of the big questions I have right off the bat is about the work you do with the mirrors, because I know they're essential for the mission, but they're very complex and sensitive instruments. So what was it like to develop and build these mirrors? Oh, it was a great challenge. Uh, we actually built four mirror modules for XB. Three of them will fly on the observatory and we have one spare. How do you test something so complex like these mirrors in space when you really can't test unless you go there? Well, so what we did was after we built the mirror modules, we subjected them to what's called environmental testing, where all the relevant environments that the mirror module would experience on its way up to orbit, we tested that on the ground at Marshall Space Flight Center. So these are things like thermal testing or vibration testing because rockets vibrate quite a bit when they launch or shock testing because as the observatory goes through its deployments, it deploys a long boom to set the optics at the correct focal length. There's a shock associated with that. And so the space is an interesting thermal environment. It gets, it can be very cold and it can be very hot. So we put the mirror modules through thermal testing to make sure that they'll work. And then the key, is after all of that environmental testing, we calibrate them again here at Marshall Space Flight Center to make sure that they work. Calibrating means that we put them in a facility called the Stray Light Test Facility. This is an X-ray beam line. It's where you have a big long vacuum chamber. It's 100 meters long and you put an X-ray source at one end and you have the optic and a detector at the other end and you take a picture of that X-ray source and it's pretty much like a star. It's very close to how a star would look in the sky when the observatory is doing its thing on orbit. And so this helps you gain confidence, make sure that it's going to work like you expect when it's in space. And that had to be a tense moment, waiting to see whether uh, your mirrors had withstood all of those elements. You have no idea, yep. I, <laughs> I painstakingly had my hands on every single mirror shell and all 96 of the mirror shells that went into these four modules and I glued them all in place and I was very eager to, to see the results after that, uh, after that calibration to make sure all was well. That's gotta be a great feeling though when you have gotten the results back and you feel confident like you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, that's a unique job. Uh, tell me a little bit about what it means now that XP is about ready to launch. Oh, it's so special. It's an incredible feeling to have literally touched a piece of hardware and put so much, so much work into it and, uh, and then know that it's going to be up in space making measurements that nobody's ever made before. That's what's special about it for me. Well, as we've learned at NASA, you can never get enough science, especially as we start to look even deeper and deeper into space. Stephen, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And joining us now is the project manager for XP, Randy Baggett. How are you doing, Randy? I'm good. Good. Thank you. Are you feeling pretty good? Uh, yeah. It is. <laughs> it's getting close. We're ready, I think. So as, as project manager, uh, one, of the, one of the things when we talk about all these big missions at NASA, it takes a lot of partners. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure XP has many, just you know, many partners uh, uh, for this mission. Can you kind of identify the, the major players and what their roles are? Sure. Yeah, uh, you know, we're fortunate to have uh, our international partners who was a big contributor for XP because of the detectors and the instrument that uh, was provided through Italy. That's our uh, Italian space agency contributed that. So that's a that's a very fortunate for this mission and it enabled us to do obviously the, the science that we've heard about already, and also our partner at uh, at Ball Aerospace. Uh, Ball is responsible for, for actually fabricating and, and uh, building the instrument, the, the telescope, and also the uh, I'm sorry the uh, spacecraft, and also the payload. So and integrating that and testing it. So that has been uh, a good partnership as well. And also we have for uh, our our. Uh, mirror, uh, our optics, we had the uh, thermal shields was provided by Nagoya University over in Japan. Oh, wow. Okay. So we were, uh, had, a, had a collaboration with them. So kind of take a step, uh, a step back when you started with this mission with five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. 
how did you uh, how, how do you come up with, with with partners international partners for a mission like this? Well, primarily through our PI and, and the team that was assembled then, we you know had looked at the best you know opportunities there that we could collaborate and allow for uh, the best proposals. And being competitive, selected, it was uh, important to to get that, of course. So, yeah, I think in you know in that time we we basically just looked at what was out there that we could could uh, collaborate with and got to try to get the best. Now, when you look at a project like XB, uh, there's always challenges along the way. I mean, what are some of the challenges that you face with this mission, and how did you overcome them? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's been quite challenging in, se in several ways. We've had some uh, issues, of course, with uh, the pandemic, of course, and, and then that has, uh, you know, also some, some things with the, even the government shutdown and, and understanding how that has affected us is, <laughs> has been a challenge in some ways. But uh, as far as just the technically, you know, I think the guys have uh, pulled together. We've kind of changed our operations with the pandemic and, and worked a lot from home, obviously. And, and of course, the technicians and the guys building the hardware, they've been able to come in and uh, we've been able to, to safely do that. So that's, it's been a, a bit of a challenge and uh, unique, obviously, for, uh, for a mission like this. You know, to, to make a mission like XP successful, it, it, it really comes down to the people. Right. And you lead a great team of, of scientists, researchers, technicians. Tell me about the people of XP. Yeah, I mean, that's exciting to, to see, you know, <laughs> how they've grown first and, and the opportunities that they've had. And, and of course, many of them, uh, you know, are, are, are doing things they love to do. And, of course, uh, you know, that's, a, that's an important thing for all of us. Now, okay, Randy, we, we're, you know, just uh, over 13 hours away, uh, 1 o'clock in the morning launch. Um, I've got to ask you a, a, a serious question. Do you, have you thought about your pregame or pre-launch meal yet? <laughs> no, I'm, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to get that. Uh, but, yeah, I hadn't really thought about it, but I'm, 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 I'll be ready. Well, you know, Blair was telling me that you've know, you got to have Italian food. Oh, yeah? But the problem is sometimes the time it's heavy, right? Yeah, if it, yeah. If it sits in your stomach, you may fall asleep right. and miss the launch. Right. So you don't want to do that, though. Right. No, I don't want to do that. So I'll, I'll be careful. Thank you. <laughs> well, Randy, <laughs> thanks for thanks. that reminder. <laughs> <laughs> well, Randy, thank you so much for being on the show. Good luck with the launch. And thank you. we can't wait to see the, uh, the first sets of data to come in. Yeah, yeah, us too. Let's take a look at the pad right now as we see the Falcon 9. What a beautiful sight. The XP spacecraft is inside the fairing. Uh, but coming up next, we have Franklin Fitzgerald and Mick Waltman. And Mick's going to take us to the, what it takes to get a rocket like the Falcon 9 to the launch pad and ready for flight. We're back with Mick Waltman from the Launch Services Program. Good morning, Mick. Good morning, Franklin. Glad to be here, man. Excited for launch this morning. Absolutely. Uh, can you give us a, a rundown on the, um, the, uh, the Falcon 9 and XP right Yeah, now? absolutely. Uh, the team last night uh, came in. They uh, mated the spacecraft to the Falcon 9 a couple days ago, came in early last night, uh, got it mounted to the transport erector, transported the whole vehicle out to the uh, pad, got it up, hooked up the umbilicals to make sure power and commodities were there, did some vehicle checkouts to make sure everything was good, spacecraft did their communication checkouts, all was good, and uh, the team is now uh, preparing for an early morning launch, uh, later this evening, early tomorrow morning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what is the weather looking like right now for, for this 
uh, yeah, weather is really good right now for launch, and uh, we've got about a 10% possibility of violation, or actually a 90% go for launch early this morning. Uh, we do have uh, the, Air, the Space Force weather officer did tell us we have a front moving in over the next couple days, but uh, hopefully we're going to get XB off early this morning on the first attempt, and we'll be good to go. Now, a couple of days ago, LCRD was uh, delayed a little bit uh, because of some high-level winds. Uh, is there any chance of that happening, and how long is the window for this launch? Yeah, so always the weather uh, thing going on here at the Cape, but like I said, tonight or early this morning, we've got a 90% chance of go, so that's looking good. However, XB does have a 90-minute window today. Um, the unique thing about the Falcon 9 rocket, though, is once we start fueling and we put densified locks on board uh, the rocket, we have now picked a specific time in that 90-minute window, and we're going to have to launch at that time. So just prior to putting fuel on board, we can pick any moment in that 90-minute window. But once we start loading fuel uh, at about T minus 35 minutes, we're, we've picked our T0 for today. And that's, that's one of the differences between SpaceX and, say, for instance, ULA in the way that the, the rocket is fueled. Yeah, it's absolutely a difference uh, from other manufacturers uh, because SpaceX uses this densified liquid oxygen to be able to get as much liquid oxygen into the rocket as they can in order to have enough fuel not only for ascent to get the mission done, in this case XB, but also have some fuel left over for their first stage landing, uh, which is unique for this mission because this will be the fifth time we've used this first stage booster. Now, the processing of the, the satellites and the rockets change from launch provider to launch provider, uh, but can you tell us a little bit about how uh, SpaceX does theirs horizontally on the ground? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the spacecraft comes in, uh, usually arrived here at Kennedy, uh, for the XP mission. They did their processing in the payload processing facility. Then once they were encapsulated, they were rolled over to the hangar, uh, and then SpaceX mated the spacecraft to the Falcon 9 rocket in the horizontal position. And then once that's all done, checkouts are all done, as I said earlier, they put the rocket on the transport erector. They get that ready to roll to the pad as one huge assembly. So the whole rocket, and then they lift that up on the pad to go uh, vertical for launch. And what's unique about that is that transport erector is also what we call the strong back. You'll hear that later. That's used at launch uh, early this morning. That strong back will come back several degrees just prior to launch, and then we'll get ready. So unique, unique processing that SpaceX does with the Falcon 9 in that in that category. Can you talk to us a little bit about the significance of using Pad 39A? Oh yeah, we're very excited. Launch Services Program. This is our first time launching off a of historic 39A. You know, 39A was used for the Apollo program, uh, shuttle program, and uh, launch services. All of our scientific missions have typically gone from the Cape side here at Kennedy Space Center, uh, but this is uh, very important for us. We're launching off a of 39A, our first scientific robot, a robotic mission. Uh, we're excited about that. The team will be in firing room four, historic firing room four over at the Launch Control Center here on Kennedy Space Center. Um, I'm, I'm jazzed about it. It's, it's uh, exciting to see a scientific mission go from uh, that pad. Now, can you talk to me a little bit about the, the pads that SpaceX has here uh, between the Cape and Kennedy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as we mentioned, 39A, that's where XB is going to be launching for uh, later tonight, early this morning. Um, but SpaceX also has Launch Complex 40, which is on the Cape side. And what that uh, does for them is having the two pads here on the East Coast is they can alternate between the pads mission. So that cadence of launches that they have, they can keep that up by alternating between, uh, between the pads. And then on the West Coast, they have uh, Slick 4E, which we were just at uh, a couple weeks ago for the DART yeah, mission. Absolutely. Um, they have that out there on the West Coast that they can continue launching from. Uh, for polar orbits and, and things like that. So those three major pads that SpaceX has allows them to uh, keep up that cadence that they have, and it's great to see what they are doing with all the missions, not only NASA LSP missions, but some of their Starlink missions and some of their commercial partners. Uh, from launch to launch, you are on console or doing launch commentary. What are you going to be doing this evening? I will be doing launch commentary for the XB mission, uh, calling the launch, uh, uh, most importantly, the last seven minutes down to liftoff. It uh, be exciting to see XB get on its way. Uh, this, as, as we heard earlier in this show, exciting science that XB is going to be doing. Uh, very unique, and I'm looking forward to uh, what we get out of that. Well, Mick, that sounds like uh, you have a, a pretty interesting uh, day and morning. 
in front of you. Uh, we look forward to your coverage, which uh, begins at 12.30 on NASA TV, so make sure you tune in. And for future videos and uh, follow-up to this mission, you can check us out on NASA EDGE on our website, uh, at uh, our YouTube channel, our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter feeds. Uh, you're watching NASA EDGE, an inside and outside look of all things NASA. At all things NASA. At all things NASA. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.